the ones that I have I got from Wakiri is Adelopis Balios. And then I have Adelopis Elegans now. And then I have the purple toads, the Adelopis Barbatonii. And then forgive my pronunciation on them. I, I didn't take any Latin courses or anything like that. So it's just <laughs> what I've heard from other people saying um, that have been a little more educated than me and stuff or my own interpretation to it. Right, um, okay. And then I have a black and yellow species as well. And they were just labeled as uh, Spumarius, um, but they're almost identical to the Barbotonii with their pattern, their call and everything, but their color. So I think there's a lot of information on them that we don't necessarily know because not all of them come with the locality information from where exactly in the country of origin they get collected from. Now, all four of those species, no one had successfully actually reproduced in captivity? So Wakiri has bred um, their species regularly under human care. Gotcha. Um, the purple toads is the ones that I uh, kind of nailed and struck gold with for being the first. Yeah. Um, other places have had spawns and had metamorphosis and stuff, but nobody's been able to um, rear them out of water successfully and have them survive long term. And they're, they're such a striking looking animal. I mean, they're really bizarre. The purple it's, is so it's fake too. looking. Their tadpoles are incredibly small it, right. and they metamorphosize out incredibly small too. Just a, just a few millimeters in size. So can you tell us a little bit about that process of, of trial? I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that you maybe had some failures as well working with them. Yeah, I, I had some breed? trial and error, some learning curves and stuff. Um, I, I, one of them, I actually call it like the, the Pompeii syndrome. Um, I went with a very large tadpole tank um, in the world of water. The larger volume of water, the more stable it often is, and the less likely parameter swings can happen fast. It can still happen. Tanks crash happen and stuff, but there's a little bit more leeway with the larger body of water. Uh, temperature change happens slower. Oxygen loses, is lost slower, et cetera. Um, so things just happen slower. So I have a 180-gallon tadpole tank. Wow. It's very intimidating and it's very fast flowing. That's a very large surface area. It's three foot wide and almost eight foot long. Um, so it is uncovered. So when they began to metamorphosize, it happened incredibly fast. Overnight, they just started kind of climbing out everywhere. And I didn't anticipate it happening that fast. I assumed, you know, they'd, they'd pop their legs, I'd see them, and I could take them right out. Um, and they had plans. They still had full length tails and everything, and they were climbing out of the water. Um, so that very first day for metamorphosis, when I came out, there was a couple of them up on the edge of the tank because it's open topped. It's household humidity. Um, and these little neotropical animals cannot survive in our North American household humidity. Um, so there was, you know, a couple of them that were, were dried up and in different positions and everyone was in a little position. So they kind of looked like little Pompeii people. <laughs> um, so that was the biggest learning curve. But once I figured out the emergent states and what to look for on the size, when they start climbing out of water and stuff, I'm able to adjust for it and suck them out of the water and tricky baste them and get them into a little smaller deli cups in the vivariums and habitats where they'll grow out from. So I don't have to worry about them um, climbing out and perishing. So you still use that large of a, yeah, it's still 180, it. but so and that's just to keep the water clean. Yep, yep. So it's a it's a very large environment. So it creates um, a large space for the tadpoles to naturally forage on, and it gives me uh, my safety grace and my water parameters because the tadpoles are incredibly sensitive for water parameters. In in the wild, are they found in quite fast flowing streams? Is that why yeah, you added so lots of power to it? There's not a ton of information on the tadpoles about them in the wild and stuff. But from where you find them in Amplexus, from a lot of the photos from the photographers and stuff like that, and the research papers where they found tadpoles, they have been fairly steep, inclined, um, fast-moving streams. Um, and the, the toads seek out a nook and cranny that's kind of void of light, a little bit slower flow to lay those eggs. But once the tadpoles hatch and disperse, they're out in that flow. Um, they suction cup in place. Kind of like an algae eater, the Plecostomus fish or the Odocinctalus. I yeah. don't know if I said that right either. Um, so they kind of suction cup in that high flow and scoot along and rasp with their mouth parts to eat on that algae. So that large environment is also a really good exhibit. It's got some really nice water pumps that create waves going across it. So it's really cool for the public that come through on our tours and stuff to see the environment for them. So. Natalie, um, Natatax in Canada. Oh yeah, sorry, I said Natasha. Yeah, I meant Natalie. Yeah, 
Yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. Um, she did do it in a 40 gallon breeder tank and she did serious numbers as well. Um, so it, it is possible. Um, something I want to point out, the common denominator between us for the success with it is, I think, saltwater um, experience. We both have saltwater reef tank experience, and a lot of that is the balancing and managing the water quality for the tadpoles. Um, normal dart frog tadpoles, you know, you do, you can check the nitrogen cycle, you can check for ammonia, nitrates, phosphates, um, but you add tannins to the water and it helps buffer the water's pH and stuff like that. Um, the... Kind of forgot where I was going with that. Hopefully. Oh, I just just talking about the tannins. I mean, I, I can imagine that you have dart frog people who are used to adding tannins into the tadpole water, yes. and then they try to do yep. that with the toads, and it's a it's a disaster. Yep. Interesting. And, and then, so you know, you solved the problem of them emerging faster than you thought. Did you end up dealing? Did you have any of the spindly leg issues that they? I were have ha- had no issues with spindly leg syndrome with okay. the adult. I did have a single issue with some Ufaga early on, um, but I contributed that to having too many deposit sites and the the single female was raising too many progeny at once. And she was kind of spreading her feeder eggs thin between them because they were metamorphosizing a little bit smaller mm-hmm. than an average large obligate frog would. Gotcha. Once now, I-, I removed the extra lay sites and she consolidated her eggs and feedings to uh, a minimal number of tads, it, it corrected itself immediately, the next generation, the next project. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, so uh, uh, with, the, with the Adelopas, I think one of the things that Natalie was saying that I think is probably the, the genius part on your side is the, the, one of the issues is feeding the tadpoles, I think, if I'm remembering yeah. correctly. And, be, and you already mentioned how tiny they are. So maybe tell us about how, why that's a problem, that, like how, how the challenge of feeding such a small animal and how did you actually overcome that? So they're incredibly sensitive to water parameters. And when you add artificial foods to water, um, it essentially starts decomposing incredibly fast. It's not like a, a living animal that you're putting into the water. It's a, a, a food that's kind of just sitting there. So it, it starts degrading and you can have a spike in parameters uh, just an incredibly sharp, fast spike from food degrading in that water. And the tadpoles are similar to corals in their sensitivity. So if there's swings in it, it can cause deficits for them. And it may not be an issue right now. It may be an issue later during their metabolic process when they metamorphosize. Um, so keeping incredibly stable water parameters is very important. So you've got to control what you feed ba- while balancing the water parameters at the same time. It could be as little as, you know, adding a couple feeding stones to extra and you can cause the water to foul a little more than you want to. And that can affect pH. It can affect the dissolved oxygen level. Um, it can affect many different things, including an ammonia spike, which would be disastrous. Right. So, so how do you solve that? How do you, how do you feed them without screwing up the water quality? Um, for my case, it is the large volume of water as a safety net. Okay. Um, I have a large beneficial bacteria colony in that environment, so it can deal with any extra um, food in it and not leaving the food in for an extended period of time. Um, I put it in in the morning and by the end of the night or the next morning, I take it out. I don't let it sit in there any longer than absolutely possible. Even if there's still food on it and stuff, I'll scrub it off and I'll let it dry out and I'll reapply the food paste to it and then let it dry out before I feed it again. Um, so that's, that's one of the things to mitigate that. I also run some media in my filters, um, just in case there is a spike that media can help absorb it and counteract it as well. And that's just replaced and replenished periodically, um, as it expires or is needed. And and then for the food pace itself, is that something that you just create? So I have added some stuff to it that are like my own tweaking to it, if it makes sense. But it is one of the bases from what the zoos do for the the Adelopis zateki, the Panamanian golden frogs. Um, there's a ton of awesome information that the accredited zoos put out. Um, and it's uh, really cool to go read through all that. Um, some people may recognize the names too, because they're people that are in the zoo field and in the hobby trade as well that are doing some of the studies and stuff too. So if you ever look up some of the Adelopus papers, keep your eyes peeled on the names for them. So it's cool to see people you may actually know that are doing the research. Yeah, that is fascinating. And so, I mean, I imagine it must've been pretty exciting when you had those first froglets. Yeah, I, uh, I, I definitely jumped around a little bit and uh, <laughs> I, I didn't get my hopes up 
at first too much. You know, I posted about it after a couple of weeks when I knew the eggs were fertile and stable. But I knew that just because I had eggs and tadpoles doesn't mean I was going to have healthy animals out of water. Um, but after a month or so of the first ones climbing out of water and I saw they had good, strong legs and they started feeding right away, I was pretty stoked and hopeful that I was going to you didn't do good with the project. So I was very, very excited. And I imagine the fact that Natalie had success as well probably makes you pretty excited knowing that your system oh, is I, something that I, can be replicated. I, honestly, I, I was equally, if not more excited, I'd say I'd tickle pink um, about having another person to do it, especially with my progeny too. Um, and then just this last spring right now, uh, my old vet from New York, she's here in Texas now, up north near Dallas. Um, but she got some from me and she's got some metamorphs climbing out of water with good legs right now too. So that's the, the second round with them. That's the another one in the United States, which is super, super cool. That's amazing. And can you tell us just a little bit about the care of the adults? Is it very similar to dart frog care? Yeah, or there's things so that you're doing I'd differently? say the caring for the adult Adelopus, um, even juveniles, it's 